Hi. Assalamu alaikum. May the peace of God be upon each and every one of you. Welcome to Gems for the Traveler. My name is Imam Muhammad Abdul Aziz. I work at the Salam Center in Sacramento, California. In this series, we explore the different facets and the different names and attributes of God Almighty. This is the month of Ramadan, and Muslims come to the mosque in order to learn, in order to grow spiritually, and connect with their Creator. In this series, we attempt at learning more about God through studying His names. I invite each and every one of you to join us on this beautiful journey to learn more about the qualities and the attributes of the Creator of heavens and earth. Thank you so much for tuning in. Assalamu alaikum. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Salatu wa salamu ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. I begin in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the beneficent, the merciful. And I seek his blessings and peace upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And upon his companions, upon his family, upon his followers. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he make us amongst the best of them. Allahumma ameen. Brothers and sisters, we've been going through names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I'll just continue in that same tradition. Um, can somebody just do a quick review of the names? Somebody who has a loud voice so everyone can hear. Sister, would you like to do one with the young sister here? One more. Two more. And Khalik and what? Al Rafiq, is that the last one? Okay. Uh, okay. Zakbar Khair. Uh, can we get a takbir for the sister? Takbir. <laughs> Mashallah, I, I didn't even know all those. Um, so the names that I wanted to go over tonight um, follow in the same tradition, of course. They're names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I want to draw your attention towards. And as usual, you have a chance to guess them. So I'm going to give you one clue. These are names that not only describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's status as the highest, but they also describe our status, our real status to us. There are two names, by the way, so you, you have double the chance of getting them right. Would anybody like to take a guess? They're names that describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's status as the highest and remind us of our status in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or our true status. No, it's not an Ali. Ali, no. That was close, but no. No, it's not. You guys aren't going to get it by the way. Say again? No, it's not. It's not. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a couple more clues. Almost every single prophet uh, whose story we know, whether through the Quran or through the Hadith, highlights these two names throughout the story. These two names are always highlighted. Even if they're not mentioned in the story, they're always highlighted. Al <laughs> um, no. These two names are basically what make any hero and villain in a story. We got, we got a brother who got it. Are you candy? No, I don't candy. I'm sorry. <laughs> the brother said Al Muiz, and the second one should be then. No. Let me give you the last hint. These two names are polar opposites of each other, but serve the same purpose. Al Muiz, Al Mudil. Yes, Al Muiz and Al Mudil. Very good. Zakallah khair. I'll give you candy some other day, uh, The two names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I want to talk about are Al Mu'iz and Al Mudil. Uh, the one who raises in honor. The one who raises in honor Al Mu'iz. And the one who lowers in disgrace or humility Al Mudil. Now, before I say anything else about these two names, before I you know, give you explanations or go through linguistics, I want to make a point uh, I think that we're all familiar with, but just a reminder 
uh, about humanity and human societies. I think it is necessary to make this point because this is basically um, this is the, the, the context within which I want you to think of these names. Human societies have existed throughout you know, history, and they've existed in all different kinds of ways. There have been civilizations that have risen and fallen in all different places, in all different parts of the world, in all different kinds of times, with different technologies and different cultures and different customs and different societal norms. You would agree, right? This is, this is a fact. And each culture, each society has, has so many things that make it unique, but at the same time there are certain things throughout all of these societies that bind them together. There are certain things that all of these societies have in common. And one of those things that every single society has in common is its understanding of status, is the importance of status in the place in which an individual holds in society. So your status and your value to society is always important, no matter which society you belong to or which civilization you come from. This could be applied to the uh, native tribes that live right now in the Amazon forest. Um, this could be applied to ancient empires such as Rome and, and the Byzantine Empire, the Persian Empire, the Chinese Empire. I could go on and on. This could be applied to, I'm sure, you know, societies and civilizations that we haven't even discovered yet. And it could also be applied to our society today. Right? Western civilization, status is still important. Right? Your esteem and the way people look at you and the things people say about you and the value, the value that you are perceived to have in that society is important. Al-Mu'izz, the one who raises in honor, the one who raises in value, and, and the one who strengthens, as one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seems to pick certain people in these societies and raise them in this, in this way. And at the same time, Al-Mudhil, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seems to pick other people and humiliate them in some ways, and humble them, and lower their status. So let me ask you a very, um, well if, first of all, if I was to ask for a show of hands, if I was to say, how many of you in this room feel that you are a valuable member of society? I hope that everyone would raise their hands, right? In some way or in some shape or form, you all think of yourselves as valuable. You all assign yourself some value. Maybe some of you think that your value is small, others of you think that your value is great. Some of you attach your value to worldly things uh, that may, do with, may have something to do with your job. Um, you know, for one brother, he may be an investment banker, right? He manages lots of money, and he's very good at his job, and he gets promotions all the time. This makes him feel that he's valuable. For a sister, uh, it may be something like uh, the family she belongs to, right? Her family is, is an honorable family with a good name and a good reputation, and they can trace their lineage back to maybe some great person in history. Right? And she carries that name of her family with honor and dignity. For another person, it may be that their value is attached to the services that they provide. Right? Maybe you volunteer all the time at the masjid. Right? And uh, you're helping to make the Salam Ramadan program what it is. And you feel that if it wasn't for you, uh, the Ramadan program wouldn't be all that it's kicked out to be. Right? For others of you, you know, for another sister, maybe her fashion sense. Right? She feels that her understanding of beauty and of, of aesthetics is beyond you know, what most people perceive and so she is always setting new trends with her new hijab styles and whatnot. Right? There's all different kinds of things that you may use to assign yourself value. And these things are, are vast. They're, you know, any single thing that you can think of in this world, somebody probably uses that thing to assign themselves value. So take a moment and imagine in your own mind all the things that you feel make you valuable. The big things and the small things. Think about all the things, and try and fill your mind with all the things that you perceive as valuable. Now let me ask you a question. What if all of that disappeared? What if every single thing that you could store into your mind as what gives you value and makes you a valuable person disappeared? Right, this brother, he's, he has a great job, suddenly he's unemployed. That sister, she has a great reputation, suddenly there's rumors being spread about her. This brother, he's a great volunteer, all of a sudden he breaks his arm and he can't volunteer anymore. 
right? This sister, you know, she perceives herself as beautiful, and suddenly the beauty starts to fade. Right? What if these things that we assign value to, and that we use to consider ourselves valuable, disappeared? What if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al mudil took these things away, and humbled you, and lowered you in that understanding? Let's take a more thorough examination of the names. Al-Mu'izz, the one who honors and the one who assigns value, comes from the root word Azza. Does anybody, can anybody t- share with us what Azza means? Azza. Honor, esteem, uh, pride. Uh, there's another understanding of the word Azza to mean to succeed at something or to prevail, right? Azza. Is there another name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that has the same root? Al Aziz. This is the more common one, right? Al Aziz. We all know this one. Uh, Al Aziz comes from the same root. The word, al, the, the name Al Mu'iz roots itself in this term. And this, this term, Azza in Arabic, this root is one of the most rich and, and um, beautiful roots in Arabic. Uh, it really demonstrates the the vast understanding of each individual word that, that Arabic has and the, the beauty of this ancient language. The word Azza can mean, it can, can imply strong and powerful, it can imply noble and honorable, it can imply rare and excellent. The word Azza, for example, as, as I mentioned, it means prevailed or succeeded. Uh, your Izzu, uh, he honored something or he in, increased something in status. Before Islam, the Arabs used to have an idol by the name of Uzza. Uzza was one of the idols, right? This was supposed to be the daughter, one of the daughters of Allah. Um, Astaghfirullah. Uh, I can't believe I said that in Masjid. Uh, but yeah, this is basically supposed to be one of the daughters of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And they worship this idol. Uh, the name I'tazaz means what? One that is prideful, one that is proud and, and majestic in his, in his, own, in his own way. And then the name al mudil comes from the root word dil, the root word dil. And this root has connotations of something that is low and disgraced. To be a base or the lowest of the low or humiliated or brought down or even hanging low. Uh, Yudhillu, for example, means what? He degraded, he disgraced something. The word dhal is used in, in the Qur'an various locations to mean weakness, to mean uh, humility, to mean disgrace. And th- this isn't the only understanding of the word, of, of the word dhil. Uh, for example, in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هُوَ الَّذِي جَعَلَ لَكُمُ الْأَرْضَ ضَلُول Right? He made the earth manageable. He made the earth tameable and, and subservient to you. Right? So it's not always a negative connotation, but it basically has this understanding of something that is lowered. I mentioned earlier that every story of any prophet that you can think of has, a, is in some way or the other, highlights these names. Now, what evidence do I have for that? Well, let's consider some of the stories of the prophets. Let's consider the story of Nuh. Was it not al muiz that honored Nuh with long life? Was it not al muiz that honored him with prophethood? For how many years? For 900 years? 950 years? Was it not Al-Mu'izz that gave him these honors? That raised him among, above the rest of society and said, You are worthy of being a prophet of Allah. You are worthy of carrying this honorable message. And in the same token, was it not al mudil that caused Nuh salam to suffer all that humiliation? Because for 900 years, he preached to his people continuously telling them the same message, continuously trying to get across a simple idea to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one that provides and sustains and watches over you and loves you and uh, calls back to you. He constantly preaches this message and only a handful of people follow. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him a task that is even more humiliating. Nuh lives in the middle of a desert and Allah asks him to build an ark, a boat. And imagine the kind of mockery that people gave him. No, what is wrong with you? What are you doing? We thought you were crazy, yeah. But now what? What are you doing? A boat? A big boat? 
Is this for your family? Is this, you know, what are you doing? And people mocked him and made fun of him. And Nuh was steadfast. And he knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had something in mind. He knew that Al Mudil did this for a reason. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al Mu'iz, honored Nuh to be the savior of his people, even though there were few, to be the one who built this ark and saved people from a massive flood that caused huge destruction. Right? This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al Mu'iz, Al Mudil. How about another prophet? And this one I think will hit home with some of the youth. How many of you young people have been asked uh, by somebody older than you, go get me a, a glass of water? Every, probably everybody when they were young at some point was asked by somebody older than them, go get me a glass of water, go get me this, you know, a command. And, and sometimes it seems a little bit harsh. Right? Sometimes it seems a little bit like you're a servant and, and they're asking you to do things as a servant. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you these commands. I, I mean, people give you these commands and you feel degraded in a way. Dawood alayhi salam, a young man, very young boy, already a lowly shepherd, right? He doesn't, he doesn't have much status in his society. He's just a shepherd. Dawood is asked to be not a soldier in the army of Talud, but a servant in the army of Talud. So he can't, he's not even good enough to fight in the army. He just needs to stand on the side and serve them when they need things, right? This is Al-Mudil. And then Al-Mudil, who is also Al-Mu'iz, honors Dawood by making him the savior of his people. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Mudil, who takes this low shepherd and turns him into the king of his people. And this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Mu'iz, operates. Tonight we're reciting from, the surah, from surah Yusuf. Right? And, and we know the story of Yusuf, so I'll just go through it quickly. Al Mu'iz honors Yusuf by making him one of the favorite sons of his father, who was already a prophet. And honors him with a dream. What was in the dream? In the dream, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows him that the sun, the moon, and eleven stars are bowing to him. These are honors. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in his capacity as Al Mudil, degrades Yusuf, humbles Yusuf. Because his brothers plot against him and he is weak against their plot. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows him to be lowered even more into slavery. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows him to be lowered even more into jail. And he spends some time in jail. Why? Why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do these things? Why does an innocent soul suffer so much? In fact, isn't this the question that atheists ask all the time? If, if there's a God, then why do innocent people suffer? Right? Why is there suffering in the world? It's simple, brothers and sisters, because this is not the end. Because it's, the story's not over. The end happens when you accept the end. The end of the story occurs when you allow for, the, for it to be the end of your story. And Yusuf, had he not been lowered so much from being plotted against by his brothers to slavery, to jail, perhaps the king of Egypt would never have heard of him and asked for his help. Perhaps he would have never had the opportunity to become basically the minister of agriculture in all of Egypt. To be one of the most important people in the kingdom. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reunites Yusuf with his family. And what happens? And his mother and father and his brothers bow to him. Just as he saw in the dream. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala operates both as Al-Mu'iz and Al-Mudhil at the same time. By both honoring and humbling somebody, such as Yusuf, so that such an honor as this prophecy could come true. Brothers and sisters, I'm not sure if this is, this is making clear what Al-Mu'iz and Al-Mudil mean in terms of names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Think about it this way. Who is the most honored company of soldiers in the history of mankind? I'm asking Muslims, so I'm sure there's a biased answer. But who is the most honored company of soldiers? Say again. Not, not, not the most honored soldier, the most honored company of soldiers. Who were fighting which Sahaba? They fought in the Battle of Badr, right? They fought in the Battle of Badr. They were the most honored. Al Mu'iz honored them above any other company of soldiers ever in the history of mankind. Right? But what does he call them in the Quran? He says about them, 
Adil. And you were a weak, low band of soldiers. But he honors them. He gives them the greatest honor. This is the quality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Al Mu'iz and as Al Mudil, operating at the same time. Let me show you a story that really struck me. There's this woman, you know, she's a good, pious woman. Uh, she, you know, she, she really likes uh, doing the right thing and she has an affinity for, for goodness. Uh, and one day she gets married. Uh, and she gets married to a man who's wealthy, who has a high status, he's very well respected in society. Um, but he's not the most religious and most pious of, of people. Uh, he's just, you know, the average guy in that sense. He, you know, he's always looking out for himself. Um, and he's kind of a self-made man. And this is how he's so wealthy and so rich. One day they're sitting down for dinner and uh, they hear a knock at the door. So he tells his wife, you know, go, go check the door. So she goes and answers and there's a beggar at the door. And he's saying, you know, can you give me some, some food? I'm, uh, I'm starving. I haven't eaten in a long time. And he looks distraught and he looks, you know, downtrodden. And so she returns to her husband. She said, there's a beggar outside. He asks for food. And so he gets up. And he walks to the door and slams the door in the beggar's face. Many years later, you know, for unrelated reasons, uh, you know, their marriage goes on and eventually they get divorced. For completely unrelated reasons. And then a few years later, this, this same woman ends up getting married again. And this time she's married to a, to a, you know, a good, kind-hearted man. Somebody who's not as wealthy and not as rich as the first husband, but he's a good man, he has a good heart, he's kind, he's generous, he's very giving. And one day, just like any other day, uh, husband and wife are sitting down for dinner and there's a knock at the door. And uh, the wife goes and she checks the door and there's a beggar at the door. And he says, can you give me some food? I haven't eaten in days. And he looks distraught and downtrodden. And she comes to her husband and she says, there's a beggar at the door. And he's asking for food. And without hesitation, her husband picks up the entire tray, the entire tray of food, and walks to the door and hands it to the man. He hands the entire tray of food that they were going to eat to the man. And when he returns and he comes inside, he sees his wife sitting at the table and she's crying. She's weeping. And he says, what's wrong? What, what is it? What's happened? He, he tries to comfort her and she says, many years ago I was married to a man and just as today, a beggar came to our door knocking and he asked for food. And my husband, of the time, slammed the door in his face. And he says, you know, that's okay, that's nothing to cry about, you know, we, we did it differently. And she says, you don't understand, this beggar was my first husband. <laughs> and you know what the, her husband replies? I, I do understand, I'm the first beggar. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al-mudhili, this, brought this man, this, this first beggar, to such disgrace, and dishonor, and such difficulty, and such weakness, only to later turn his life around as Al Mu'iz, to bring him such honor and dignity, to have, to have married him to such a wonderful woman, to have given him a nice house and the ability to give. Right? This is the kind of quality that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has with us. He gives us opportunities when, we, when we're downtrodden, when He puts us through difficulty, and when He humiliates us. He's giving us an opportunity. As Al Mudil humiliates us, Al Mu'iz reaches out his hand and honors us. Because think back to the original conversation that we had. We think of so many things that, that we use to assign ourselves value. We apply, we think of jobs and, and beauty and physical strength and, and wealth and all these things. Well, Al Mudil reminds us that your true value. Your true worth is not because you have these things or because you were honored at some point, nor is your true value because you were disgraced at some point or humiliated. Your true value is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His capacity as Al Mu'iz honors you to test you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His capacity as Mudil humiliates you again to test you. The fact that He cares enough to put you through these things, 
He cares enough to continue your existence and to pay so much attention to you and to create situations around you that are difficult but that are designed exactly the way He wanted them to be designed. The fact that He went through all this work just for each individual soul and there's billions and billions of souls that have existed and will exist. The fact that He cares so much, that's what gives you value. This is what assigns you true value. And this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us that your true value are, is to be measured in His eyes, not in the eyes of the people around us or the world within which we live. This is temporary. We'll be gone from here, but we will forever be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And just as a final evidence for, for my claim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala acts as al mudil and al muiz muiz every single day towards you. He does this towards you every single day, multiple times a day. Some of you come to the call and some of you don't. When you're standing in, in or when you're bowing in ruku, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked you to do what? He's asked you to take your most honorable part, your face, right? your most honorable and dignified and beautiful part of your body. And He asks you to make it even with the most dishonorable part of your body. Right? When you're standing in ruku, your back is flat and your head is even with your bottom. Am I correct? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lowers you even more. He asks you to take the most honorable part of your body and make it even lower, putting it on the ground. He acts as al mudil lowering you more and more, five times a day, multiple times in each prayer. Because al muiz is inviting you to his company. What is the moment when we're closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? In sujood. al mudil lowered you, so your face is on the ground. al muiz is in your company. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that these words are beneficial to us, that we are amongst the people who hear everything but uh, adhere to the best of it and understand the best messages that are delivered to us. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gathers in the company of the prophets, that he gathers in the company of those that he is pleased with in Jannah. Allahumma ameen. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he make us amongst the people who are capable of understanding these messages and, and delivering them and demonstrating them and living our lives by them. And I ask all of you that if I have said anything that was offensive, uh, forgive me, uh, but if I said anything that was beneficial that came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you thank him. Jazakallah uh, khair for your time. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this episode of Gems for the Traveler. Uh, if you have any questions about the material you just watched, or if you would like to come to Salam in order to join us for one of the services, please visit our website at www.salamcenter.org, or you can visit my Facebook page, www.facebook.com slash Imam Aziz. I hope that this episode touched your hearts spiritually as it did ours. God bless you all, and thank you.